Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co host. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. All right, y'all. This is part two of the conversation with Orion. This time, moving on into a conversation about Gellerpox Infected. You know, we're, we're here to talk about Gellerpox and the current competitive meta landscape a little bit. You know, for people who tuned into the Balanced podcast that we did last week, you know, we're here with Orion still to uh, chat about what makes his favorite teams fun. You know, big Gellerpox player, big Belgor player, big converter. Huge yeah. converter. Yeah. yeah. Well, ooh, yeah. thank you. That reminded me because I have to go over my Geller Pox with you for next week. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> there's a new set of Geller Pox. There are. I completely forgot, like I did with my Felgors, and I would have just showed up and you would have been mad. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Good, good. Okay, How I are want, you I feeling want to hear about them? Uh, just like yeah. you, your conversions, real quick before we move on. Um, what, what, what would you like to know? I have a like, lot of things. Converted. Are, like, what are they? You are you competing with converted? Are you competing with a uh, can you roll a crit for best Geller Pox conversions? Because he's got his. Oh, for sure. Necro Pox um, infected. You guys have a friendly rivalry, world championship rivalry. We now. actually do. We were giving each other hobby updates while we were building each other's kill teams uh, because I gave some input on him building his Necro, uh, his Necrons. And he gave me some input building my um, Dredge Pox is what they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went for deep sea yellow box nice and um they they converted close to there them. we've got old old slappy with his tentacles oh he's even more tentacly now he's got fishing hooks uh, it's stuck very in his exciting body. what's that uh, yeah the original one even has like fishing hooks stuck in his flesh mm -hmm. so you're yeah, so going the... leading way into the deep sea Yes, I re I love deep sea stuff, and I feel like it's criminally underrated in 40k because everyone just ignores the oceans, like water planets don't exist. Uh, so I was like, I mean, you can swim on Beta Decima. You can, right? And I was like, well, how come nothing's coming up from that? Like, what a criminal move to not have any water themed teams on the water board. Like, that's just some bullshit. That's some. And, and here you right are, the, the hero that we didn't deserve, bringing the <laughs> monsters out of the sea. Yeah, so I'm very excited to show them off. About, like, 20 or 30% of the team is hand-sculpted, um, which is the first for me, but it turned out really well. Nice. Um, what kind of putty are you using? Are you using green stuff, or did you use the yeah. new Tamiya putty that everyone keeps hyping up? I haven't, I have heard of that. I haven't used it yet. Um. I pretty much like to use whatever I have in house and just cry about it if it didn't work, rather than like, oh, there's a better solution. I'm like, no, this is it. This is this has to work. Um, if I if I bought it, it has to work. <laughs> As the Geller Pox player who's played through like six rounds of nerfs, mm -hmm. dude, yeah. yeah, no, can't and stop. And still it. somehow makes it to the world championship and threatens everybody every year. Yes, 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 yes. and I will continue to do so until they tell me I can't <laughs> by removing them from the game. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm no, excited. I'm excited, I'm excited to see them. How, you know, take us through the journey of a Gellerpox player, you know, from the beginning to now, because obviously the Gellerpox have changed a lot, but the game has also changed a lot in between. You know, at the first World Championships, you, I think you were the only Gellerpox player to take them, right? Uh, I've been the only Gellerpox player at every Worlds. Yes. Probably so, you know, continuing continuing the trend, I, I suspect. Maybe not this year. I think this year we might actually have competition, it sounds like. Maybe. I don't know. It depends on what happens. So there's talk of a new edition coming out. And if that comes out before Worlds, who knows what's going to happen, right? Uh -huh. um, I officially have no idea. So it's all random speculation. If like it comes out in the summer, if it comes out at Worlds, who knows? 
Yeah, um, it could be the situation that we play Worlds on a brand new edition, and it's like the first time the competitive world gets to see like high level kill team gets played on the new edition. That could be a very cool way to do it. Yeah, but if they do have a know, stream, I imagine we're going to have a lot of mistakes if that's the case. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. I'm sure. I'm sure everyone will be tripping over themselves, mixing up different versions of the game. But, you know, Gellerplox, they I know that they're a very hard team to play. Having seen you play them a fair amount at this point, maybe not as much as other people in your locals. The most important thing is not getting shot on turn one, which is very hard. How have you found that challenge to change as terrain sets have changed over time or like different regional terrain sets, you know, matter? So when I first started playing Gellerplox, um, it was like right after... It's pretty much like a week after they came out because a friend had gifted me the team before we knew they had rules. And I just painted them up because I love my rule stuff. I was like, cool, yeah, look at these guys. And then a week later, they're like, hey, guess what? There's rules for these guys. I was like, no shit. Um, so starting up, obviously, they were too strong. Um, when they were first not nerfed at all, Techno Curse would just made everybody cry. It was it's literally not insane fun- back then. <laughs> yeah, it was not a fun time for my opponent. When they took their first batch of nerfs, that was actually probably one of the most significant. Um, where they got the six of Fiona pains, the techno curse became obsolete to maybe once per game you'd get it off, stuff like that. Um, that's where it started getting really more challenging. Um, and the other nerfs I really didn't notice too much from there. Now. Like rust emanations, I didn't really care about. And then the one CP per game, I was like, eh, whatever, it's fine. Um, sometimes you didn't get that anyway because Thrice Curse just died horribly. But the team throughout terrain excluding beta decima has been pretty much the same um uh, when lvo came out with different into the dark map paps that changed a little bit because a lot of them were more drawn to the hum friendly than some of the original uh, like og into the dark maps almost all the original like on first release into the dark maps you couldn't draw into the hum to any objective which meant you were severely slower and a lot of those maps like there was one that i played layla on for a golden ticket where it was just two rooms it was just two open rooms and i looked at her and i'm just like well you got the game ggs um i managed to win that but through no merit of my own she made one silly mistake of forgetting a door um and that's what helped me get into the rooms otherwise she would have shot me to shit with preachers um so like the original maps didn't like them when we got the crit op maps that changed a lot for Geller Box to where I preferred into the dark over the open. And now it's 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 a good balance as long as you don't play on beta decima. Beta decima is near impossible. I refuse to play it. I will just not play. The Geller Box just straight up unplayable on beta decima. Even pretty with much. Be- yeah, it, with swimming, there's one chance. But uh, <laughs> like there's so many platforms where you can just position your guys where a Hulk physically can't fit on it, even if you barge. And it's just like, well, if I can't stand here, that means I can't jump here, which means I can't move to literally certain parts of the map. And I don't have enough movement to get around. Yeah. And then all the top stuff being heavy means there's no cover. And everything. And then it it completely shuts down your whole game. Like you can't score anything. You can't set up for later turns to score anything. All of your people die as they're (laughs) dangling or just hide and do nothing. Yeah. It fundamentally takes the way Keller Pox play and says, don't do it. Um, what you become is just shooting practice for the opponent. And that's not really fun. I'm okay if something's hard, um, but it fundamentally takes the way you play out of the game. And that's why I don't really like Beta Decima that much for Gellar Pox specifically. I think there's some teams that it's perfectly fine for as long as you're playing two teams that are balanced on the Beta Decima. But if one is not, it's just not fun. I'd rather not play that. Even if I have the advantage, I'd rather not play it. And how would you like fundamentally describe your approach to the four turns of kill team with Geller Pox in comparison to something like Vetguard or Crute, which I've seen you play in the past? Because Geller Pox are truly a melee horde team with four guys that got to do most of the work and a bunch of dudes that are just kind of wandering around doing objectives and sometimes trekking a grenade or sometimes a grub goes in, finishes a guy or sometimes a sludge grub goes in and toxifies like a room to like make in the dark annoying because it's got its stupid Mm -hmm. little lethal five profile. How do you approach the game and what do you feel like players are missing when they try to play Geller Pox? Because it is not like any other team, kind of like how Higher Tech Circle 
for the last couple months when they could play full security and just grind opponents down with their massive res rolls. You know, mm-hmm. they can approach the game differently. Geller Pucks, you have to approach differently. So how do you how would you describe it? Well, turn one, obviously, like the obvious one, right? Like, don't get shot. Um, you don't want to get shot unless you absolutely have to. If you do, you need to figure out what, like some boards, you can't deploy safely. You have to figure out who dies, um, who takes all the bullets so the rest can move up the board. Uh, it's a hard choice to make, typically, but some boards, it's just you have to accept that someone's going to eat bullets. They'll probably at least take two or three shooting shots down with them, but that's what you have to do. Sometimes you have to make sure that you don't get your objective stolen from you. Like versus Pathfinders on loot, a lot of times you have to double dash to one of the midfield objectives with Drawn to the Hum and a scouting dash just so they can't take your midfield objective. Um, Not any more importantly, without recon sweep. Well, even so, they can still do it with a drone forward deploy and the drone controller take it. Like that's what I had to do at Dallas. The way the map was, I had to double dash my um, screamer onto a point just so he couldn't take my point, which was. Good, because I only lost, I think, that game by one or two points. Um, had I not done that, I would have been playing probably 4-2 the first two turns behind. Um, now, unfortunately, one gun drone took me down to one wound on that Hulk immediately, which wasn't that my is a wild. Thing. That sounds like a wild dice result. <laughs> yeah, he rolled, like, I think two crits, two hits, I and I saved nothing. Yeah. Like, not a single feel no pain. Um, so that was bad. But, you know, that is what it is. Um, you have to take those risks. I knew you would shoot me because there's nothing I could do about that. You just have to know what's worth it, the point, the model, etc. Um, turn turn two, you really want to make sure to set up to not block yourself, not get blasted from an, initi- an initiative. You don't want to play to like, well, if I get initiative, I'm fine. If not, you killed three guys. Because you have to put these 15 models somewhere. Um, I think a lot of times people are really focused with the box moving everyone up. And you shouldn't do that. Sometimes you just leave guys in the back. They'll get their turn three or turn four. It's fine. Um, like a lot of times people get caught out by a blast that they didn't need to just because they moved to fly forward because they're like, well, he's got to do something. Just pass with them. Your, your opponent's going to be much more angry about that because now it's their turn again. Uh, turn one. Positioning is the key. Um, and as long as you can position well, even if you don't get everybody into the action turn two, you don't have to. You can just set up waves. Like turn two, these guys are going in. They're getting stuck. Hopefully they do some damage or they make it so they can't get shot easily. And then turn three is really where you bring all the combat support in. You break down the full plan. And turn four is where you salvage things if they went, if things went wrong. Yeah, so it's kind of like a more patient and slow play style than a lot of other, you know, outlooks. Um, I think that mm-hmm. that is that's a really good point. You can just leave people and, you know, that that applies to any hordes, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, that was very well put. Yeah, I think there are some times you can go aggressive turn one, like on end of the dark. Um, you can get some really aggressive plays going where sometimes I've gotten two charges off turn one, um, depending on how aggressive you think your opponent's going to go. Like if you see them wanting to go for an aggressive blast play, you can bait people into taking a blast play and then charge over to the blast a lot of times. Like if it's like the Balefire Acolyte or something like that, because you have enough movement to get to those doors typically withdrawn to the hump. Um, so you can play aggressive, and if I'm playing against another melee team, everything flips. Um, I am never more comfortable than if I'm playing against another like melee team like Felgors, the mirror match. Like those are the places I want to be in because I I go full engage, pretty much. Um, because you got a lot of guns on the team. People don't seem to realize that. And if if you're going against a melee team, well, just shoot them with one two damage. Chip damage is really important in melee, so. Yeah, that's definitely a big thing that people can miss because Volgar's got his flamethrower, Old Slappy's got his ridiculous tentacle gun. You've got the sludge grubs can all shoot, especially on somewhere where in the dark where melee teams like to thrive. A lot of your guns actually go from okay to suddenly scary because you've got lethal five up across the board. And your frag yeah, grenades and are group activating. What's that? Your frag grenades are group activating. They are, so you can kind of carpet bomb an area if you do it right. Uh, turn two, you can a lot of times do a draw into the hum with two mutants through an open door. And then just if you had initiative, you just chuck two frag grenades on something they didn't really see coming. And then it's like, well, I mean, they have lethal five. They're hitting on threes. It's going to do some damage. Um, sometimes 
it just doesn't work, but that's okay. Like, um, I don't think you ever caught my game at Worlds with Keekums, uh, Travis. I think you're probably busy playing at that time. But that was the strangest game I've ever played in my life, where I lost two Hawks uh, for no damage against Commandos. And um, so I basically played the game with two Hawks at the start of turn two, instead of having four. That's and crazy. I won that game somehow. We don't know what, neither of us know what happened. At the end of it, uh, we're like, wait, you won. I was like, no. Um, and I just started shooting with Glitchlings nonstop. <laughs> and that worked. The Glitchlings killed four models um, of Commandos, which was... Yeah, Kinkums was on Commandos in Portland. This is like pre-nerf Commandos, which I don't... Is like, you gotta add the context. Is that these Glitchlings, with their, what, f- three dice? One, two, four shots, hitting on fours. Um, the first one to go down was the Grot. The Grot tried to come in and take me, and I took him down in melee. Uh, so I charged him and took him down in melee <laughs> three dice. Um, and then from there, I just kept winging around and s- stealing points because he was in the center room um, on like the left hand side. And it just got to a point where like the glitchlings was like, oh, God, I need to avoid the glitchling shooting because I got in his head. Um, and I almost killed a fifth model, but we last minute remembered that he had just a scratch um, to block <laughs> a shot from from a glitchling. Uh, but I never, think I won that game by like one point, and it was. I think insane. you never discount the ability of GA two to flip the script on a single activation team, right? Because your glitchlings mm-hmm. can start pinging off wounds that now your Gellerpox hulks can two shot a commando, which is the was a scary breakpoint for them. Because if they're at eight wounds versus ten wounds, suddenly any hulk is scary again. Yeah, uh, it having those extra points of damage a lot of times, especially with the spike, the lumber ghast, um, a lot of models are like, you know, 10 wounds. If you can get like two, two wounds on them, by any means just of like you slam a fly into them and deal two damage and die. All of a sudden that model is one hit because you're going to charge them. You're going to deal at least one damage. And now they're probably at seven wounds, maybe at six. And then if you get a, if you just get a hit, usually they're dead and you don't take any damage in return. So a lot of times I look to set up those plays where it's like, well, yeah, you only took like two damage here and there, but now that means everyone's getting one shot in this corner. So, you know, this is actually uh, bleeds into a little bit of the strategic thinking that I was actually kind of interested in because you get to play Geller Pox a lot and you've done it at a high level often. Obviously, the Hulks are really important, but there's a lot of other role players like the selection of your sludge grubs, fleas or otherwise is a really big part of how you approach your turn two turn three and especially at the world championships it sounds like just picking specific models that could do one thing to chip down a commando was enough to let your galler pox hulk go in and not take damage which is obviously very scary for your opponent Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people look at the flies and the stuff like that they're like oh well what are they gonna do we're like oh well this guy maybe he could you know charge in and kill something or maybe he can stun or the grubs obviously shoot but um, they have a little bit better roles than that. When it comes down to picking the equipment, I think it's the most important part mm. of the team, more so than just you know playing well. Picking the equipment is very critical, and using it correctly is critical. Do you have any big heuristics that you've kind of leaned on, or do you generally end up being pretty dynamic with it? Yeah, I, I really do. The flies I use pretty much the least. Um, I think they're the least useful unless I'm going against a melee horde. Like, maybe I'll take one every now and again. But overall, like, unless I'm playing, like, Pulse or something, I typically my go-to is Curse Might. Curse Mites are the most versatile. You have a lot of options with them to use them for combat support. You can just charge two in because they group activate. At minimum, you're doing four damage to whoever you charged, which is nothing to shake a stick at, especially if you're, like, you're, you're an elf team and your guys are really fragile, and now they've just been minus four wounds for no reason. If you get lucky, you can deal six damage. That's not great for anybody. Yeah, uh, for any listeners who have no idea what we're talking about, because Geller Pox are not very often played. Curse Mites are the fleas, I think. So they have fly. Yeah, the fleas. Yeah, they have fly. They've got a six inch charge. They have two attacks hitting on fours, two, three with rending. But they've got a special rule where if your opponent has not full wounds, you get an extra attack and you get lethal five, which means that like Orion's saying, every once in a while you get lucky. The first one goes in, gets a crit normally, hits for three. It instantly dies because they only have two wounds. Mm-hmm. And then the next one goes in. That one now has three attacks on fours, and your opponent's already taken a, taken some damage. So you've got the three attacks, and you're generally going to be able to hit a lethal five on three dice, I think is 
about a 50 50 it's not like crazy but it's also not impossible and then suddenly your opponent's down six wounds or even just five wounds like five wounds is is already a, a good a good break point especially against anyone that is not a 10 wounder yeah it typically means if you do a double charge like that any one of your models can then kill except for like a glitch line um like if you put the mutants in a range where they can realistically bring a target down and like you have 15 operatives so sacrificing two um brings you down to 13 operatives in theory it's just like, would you start with 13 operatives to target one model on the board and have a minus four wounds? Uh, yeah, I would for sure. When um, Admech was really popular, the Rust Stalkers are a bit hard to take down. So what I would do is I would just take Curse Mites all the time and just slam them into them. And all of a sudden, all the Rust Stalkers are six wounds instead. And it's just like, well, I mean, you're not too scary when you get two shot by anything or potentially one shot. Um, so people... I think that'd be my biggest takeaway from this podcast is people don't use the curse mites enough. And I think that's wrong. People always look at the eye stingers for the potential they have, but they have a pretty good potential to not do anything as well, uh, which you don't want to do. Everything needs to do something on the team. Yeah. So when, when do you flip the script between using your gl- grubs and your mutants as like pass and delay objectives on turn one, generally, I assume, and when do you flip the script and have them go to aggro so that you can start chipping stuff? Is that generally on turn two? Is it generally on turn three? Or does it really depend on where your opponent is staged up? It really depends. Because um, depending on the board, I may not have had the option to move them up. That means I had to typically stage poorly. Yeah, like if there's a good target to go with, um, if I'm taking sludge grubs, I'll go with them first just because they're free damage in most cases. And it'll really set the tone for what the rest of my hulks are going to do. If I'm not confident that I can just go charge in with a Hulk immediately turn two and, you know, critically injure my opponent, I'll just send the bugs forward and see what they do. If they don't do anything, that makes my choice easier for the next activation. Uh, But if they do some damage, then it's like, all right, well, now I don't have to charge here because these guys are wounded. They can't really do much X, Y, and Z. If I do take Eye Stingers, usually I want them to be the first to go just because they're going to cause as much disruption as possible. Um, if they can get a stun, if they can just charge it and clog up somebody for an action, uh, it's always worth it. Um, who is your uh, ultimate MVP for the Geller Pox? Is there one like particular play that especially stands out? Uh, one play that stands out. Um, I mean, always barging with the Lumbergast is always hilarious when people didn't plan for it. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where somebody goes to block a door. I'm like, great, block that door. That's fantastic. I'll move up to the door turn one. I can't go through it. Um, I may have make sure to tell them that, like, hey, yeah, I can't go through this door. You are blocking it. Um, and then he's like, all right, so I'm going to barge. So I go through. <laughs> They've generally put a bunch of guys within, like, a four-inch radius. You can charge two or three of them, usually. And then they all take damage. And if it's a guard team, that means two of them are dead. Just because you, at minimum, deal one damage to them down to six. And then the Lumbergast typically can't fail. If you have Blessings of Infection online, which is if you fail a numerical value of three, you can retain a fails of success. Um, so a lot of times I'll tell my opponent, hey, I cannot fail this one dice roll. You're just dead in melee, which is a it's a hell of a drug. Let me tell you that much. Telling your opponent is like, yeah, I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Your turn. Um, no one's usually too happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. You don't just like soften the blow by rolling the dice and being like, oh, and this is an auto hit anyways. I rolled uh, all ones and you die anyways. Yeah. So usually if I want to soften the blow, I just won't say that. And I'll be like, OK, I'll roll my dice. OK, he's dead. Um, if I'm trying to be really nice to somebody or if like they're having a bad time with like their dice rolls and stuff, I don't want to just be like, ha ha, you're dead. Um, I, I try to consider my opponent's feelings in those cases because I, I can understand it can be frustrating if someone's just like. Yes, you're auto dead. Nobody likes hearing that. Um, but it is something that is just true with the team. A lot of times mathematically you, dead. Yeah, you need to save time a lot of times on the team because you're rolling so many dice um, to the point where it's just like sometimes you need to cut corners. And it's like, yes, kill, kill. I don't have to roll. Yeah, I mean, the team is very powerful and Lumbergast sounds like a, a big deal a lot of the times because he is reliably able to deal at least seven wounds which is obviously an amazing break point yeah in most cases he can take almost any model in theory to a one shot which is a lot of people don't respect enough because uh, you know if you're like a 10 wound model 
you're at least expecting to get two hits in. But, you know, if you if I get a little lucky and roll a three and then roll a crit, you're still one shot, uh, which a lot of Felgor players don't often see coming. Because um, then I've, I've done it a couple times with Felgors roll charging. I'll kill two Felgors with them. And then they're frenzied. They're like, okay, cool, whatever, that's fine. And then you go behind with the Curse Mites. And then you charge on the next activation. Because usually people want to activate the Frenzy guys immediately. You charge in with both Curse Mites because they GA2. And because the goats no longer have their wounds, um, the uh, fleas get lethal five from rending. So then realistically, they always take out one or both of those frenzied goats. Wow, that is actually that's amazing. Some, some hot tech right there. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love the Power Master. Man. I am very sad they got nerfed because I, I won't see them as much. I mean... I- <laughs> To be fair, the Lumber Gas plus Curse Mike combo is actually a nice operative combo anyways, because the Spike Charge hits everybody. Mm -hmm. So he can hit any meaningful pile of dorks, and if you get lucky and you spike the damage on it, suddenly the Curse Mites are really scary on a big pile. So that's cute. Yeah, no, it's a ton of fun. You can always just leave Guardsmen alive as well. If you um, just did some Spike Charge damage, you just leave them hurt. And then they have to spend time to fall back. And while you're doing that, you can then follow up with Curse Mites and it locks them in for the next turn. Stuff like that. There's a lot of play with the bugs. More so than just Oonga Boonga, they're going to go forward and charge or die. And specifically, you're trying to avoid the Eye Stinger Swarm, which I think you call that. Those are the mosquitoes. They've also got Fly. They've got the ability to drop stuns on people. That's really generally what they're used for. And I assume that they see more play on Open and Sludge Grubs see more play on In the Dark. As And Curse Mites are your, your backstop as far as the bugs go? Yeah, it depends. Um, like, if the map is really open and I need to, like, really mo- get the movement to move my bugs, I'll take Curse Mites even if... Sludge grubs are the better choice just because the sludge grubs have slow movement and it means they're more likely to get shot up. I can't really forward move with them without them getting vantage shot for some reason. I'd rather just not have that happen. Um, I will take sludge grubs and open if I'm going against a team that's very delicate. Like if I'm going against any elf team, if I'm going against any like Marines, I'll take the sludge grubs regardless because while they may not do any damage, the fact that they could and more often than not deal six damage because they can get pretty good with their shots like it's two two hitting on fours but ap1 splash one it means that minimum two, if you nail, yeah but if you if you nail three of your hits that means at minimum they're taking two damage um which cool that's what the flea the curse might would have done anyway but he's not dead <laughs> Uh, or your opponent you is get... forced to interact with it, which is also a net positive in this situation. Yeah. Because dropping an eight wound elf down to six means that now your mutants have a chance at killing an elf, which they wouldn't normally have. Yeah. Uh, or you get really lucky and the sludge grubs will just kill a model. Uh, because when they spike, they spike hard. And yeah. then there's nothing the fragile teams can do about it. Because uh, a lot of people don't take any, like, shooting saves or stuff like that or any shooting ploys against the team and then everyone freaks out when the sludge grub rolled four hits and a crit or like three hits and a crit and all of a sudden you're taking at least five damage uh, hurting those fragile teams with something which is free you know a, a two wound operative is never a good feeling and marines they can't afford a trade like that but the sludge grubs force it on them to where they don't have an option hmm. Yeah, it's a nice takeaway is that you can use these dorks that people aren't thinking about to actually make sure that your opponent, you get something out of it. Because uh, mm-hmm. taking equipment that deals five damage to an operative, I think most teams would take that most of the time. Just like I just get to say I have an activation and I deal five damage to something. That's a pretty good equipment point, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and on. I really just wanted to like highlight like a fork that's within there. Um, you pretty much said it, but just like from another angle, um, you can just like stand there and shoot at a marine with a sludge grub and if they spend the time to deal with it like they really don't have the action economy to do that and like you can super duper capitalize on it if they're killing bugs instead of something else and if they don't you can just stand there and shoot them repeatedly mm-hmm. so it's well, like the, the added icing way, on the cake they're is kind of trapped yeah if you get within two of them the icing on the cake is if they kill them on a four up you can deal another one uh, which everyone forgets, and then I'm like, "All right, I'm rolling a dice." And I'm like, "Why?" I'm like, "Well, because you took a mortal wound. That's why." He um, exploded. Yeah, he exploded, and they're like, "Oh, well, it hits your guy too, right?" No, it does, but I he think, loves it. 
I think the the one funny thing about sludge grubs on open is that they actually are one of those models that is actually small enough to hide behind a bunch of light cur- light terrain and not be visible at all <laughs> because they are yeah, the incredibly mites. small. Whereas everything yeah, some else, some curse mites and some sludge grubs yeah. can. A lot of times, like if I'm playing against mandrakes, I will put sludge grubs in my back line um, behind something where it's tall enough where you can't shoot them, and I'll put them on full full engage uh, because if they want to teleport in my back lines at any point. Um, the sludge grubs just pop out and shoot them. And well, maybe also, they don't do damage. Yeah. But more likely they will. I mean, the good thing about the sludge grubs and having those sorts of operatives in the Mandrake matchup specifically is you just screen out the areas where they can actually teleport. And sometimes they just don't mm-hmm. have good backline teleports, even if you're on engage because you're hiding behind something they just literally can't get away from. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a. I love the Mandrake matchup. That's one of my other favorites. I'm very happy people are playing them. Oh. Yeah. Geller Pox historically have been a really powerful team because they stat check people incredibly hard with their four 18 wound operatives that play closer to like 20, 22 wounds. 22 to 23, unless you're at me in the local scene and then it's like 30. Yeah, once a game and once a tournament, there will be one game where one one Hulk will play like a 30 plus wound operative. I think the first year's world championships, you were able to get ace with a, what, 15, 15 damage and you took... 11 or you, you uh, no, dodge 11 22 damage and i saved 17 of it yeah so every once in a while you'll have a superhero moment and your opponent will be like this is just unfair and you're like yes and now i will attack you yeah you just roll so many th- uh, one of the things that people don't talk about is the team rolls so many dice like statistically it's very hard to have a game where it's skewed like something will work at some capacity because you roll so many dice no matter if it's your attacks or your, you know, your saves, because you're rolling so many, you will get results, um, which is a lot of people something something they don't talk about enough. It's like, all right, yeah, I'll fail the attack dice, but it will come around statistically. I will roll really hot somewhere, um, and it's egg on your face, I guess, if it's the feel no pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the field of pain is obviously the thing that everybody knows about, but not everybody talks about, you know, six dice on fours, two, three, four is your melee profile for the tentacle guy. And every once in a while, you just get like five hits. And you're like, all right, cool, we're good. Yeah, every once in a while, you shoot a rust stalker um, at worlds, <laughs> and then he just gets just obliterated. Lost. Yeah. And you went from a bad position to a really good position. <laughs> and then charge and ended the game. <laughs> yeah, and then charge two more rust stalkers, and then overload ace's brain uh, yeah that's that great so you know we talked about the the lumber gas obviously and i we just brought up the bloat spawn you've i've got some stories about you at with the bloat spawn <laughs> just locking people up in the fall in the fallback position where people get stuck forever but we mm-hmm. haven't really talked about the flesh screamer i know we've talked a little bit about everything else everybody knows volgar everyone knows the stupid guy with the big fireball so we don't have to talk about volgar but flesh screamer i don't hear a lot of people talk about he's got the weird mixed profile of five dice on fours five six which is seemingly very good and then mm-hmm. he's got the mix the mix up of one attack on threes eight nine lethal five does he see play or is he the one that gets kind of thrown out to die oh no he, he sees a ton of play um usually the one that gets thrown out to die is the bloat spawn mm. um because if he gets a charge in um uh, there's a chance People can still fall back from him, and then, well, you know, he's just sitting pretty. Um, usually him and the lumber gas are the ones. The lumber gas is the one I'm guaranteed to die because I send him in to do the most damage possible to set up the rest of the game. Yeah, the lumber gas What the, the lumber gas does, yeah, what he does determines what I do. Um, so typically, unless Thrice Curse has a really solid target, the lumber gas is the first one in. The Flesh Screamer, however, um, he's the one that people do forget about the most where he has the APL debuffing objective ability. And what a lot of people don't realize just how good that is, where uh, a lot of folks will try to close doors on you on Into the Dark and stuff like that, because you can't open it. But as like, if I ought to activate my team, and they opened a door or something with a guard action, usually you can move around it pretty well, and then you just get within three of the guy who's within the door, and now they can't shut the door. Uh, Or if they do, like that's all they're really doing. Because it costs them all their APL, and then you just move back up and open the door. Um, he's the one that people don't recognize has an ability. Like, I played against Baki in an All Valley tournament uh, last year, and Baki didn't think he had an ability. Uh, so, like, I tried, we were playing Colts versus Geller Box. This was pre nerf Colts. 
and um, I charged onto an objective and just passed because um, I didn't I didn't want to do anything. And he's like, "Okay, cool. I'm gonna blood oath this objective." I'm like, "Well, you can't." <laughs> um, he's like, "Cause you don't even." He's like, "You don't even control it." He's like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "This guy has an ability." He's like, "He does," and you know, things spiraled out of control from there just because he didn't remember it. Most people don't. Um, or it's like you can send him on an opponent's objective on loot. If you can charge two guys, you kill one, you leave the other one alive. And then usually they try to take that point back, but you realistically need to send three more guys over to that point because you don't have enough APL to take it and um, to loot it because you cost one extra action to loot it. So a lot of folks, he can mess up the day if you're not prepared for him. He's not the best one objectively. He's not flashy. He's not doing all the crazy damage unless you are an eight operative team, eight wound team. Because I will use the one profile relentlessly, uh, where it is the eight nine lethal five. Lethal five doesn't matter. We don't care about that. Uh, one you dice. Gotta, you just got to hit the three. If you hit the three, that's an elf dead. Well, you can hit the three, or you can send the curse might in first and then hit on mm. twos. Um, and usually, I'll usually save one CP for the reroll, where it's just like, yeah, I'm hitting on twos, rerolling. You're probably dead. Um, there's a fair number of times where I'm playing against Harkin Salvagers where I'll charge two guys and just chop, chop, and uh, there's nothing they can do about it. The power and of it, a frightening onslaught. So, yeah. The, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Gellerpox do have a double fight ability. It does cost them a CP, and it does let any Nightmare Hulk just one more time, once more with gusto. And when you've got an 8 9 profile against 8 wound operatives, juicy, juicy. Yeah, now is it always a good idea? No. But do I like to live on the edge? Certainly. Um, because if I do get those chops off, the emotional damage to your opponent is just irreparable. If you don't get them off, oh well, I mean, he's a hawk, he's just standing there in melee, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> the emotional damage of having two guys disappear for one CP, and a barge maybe, you know, barging through doors where mm -hmm. people aren't expecting it, because that's generally when you can get the best double charges, is people think they're safe stage behind a door, right? Yeah, well, it, yeah, and then you just kind of push through but it's like, all right, if the chop fails the one turn, you probably have another turn to chop still. Uh, so, <laughs> and the funny thing about it is if you're injured, right, the chop goes to a four up. But if you spend for blessings of infection, uh, it's still a three up because numerical values of three turn into a success. So the chop is typically always at a three up, no matter what you're doing. Um, nice. An so undervalued against, operative. Yeah, if, if you're at an eight wound team like Hardkin or sometimes Guard, if you really want to get fancy with it, um, just go chopping. Elves, just go chopping. Even if you don't get it, the fact that you can, you could is worth its weight in gold. Nice. The Hulks, everybody hates them, but some people love them because they've some got... Some people do love wounds. them. Well, it's, it's crazy, right? When I played Felgors, nobody liked um, I was the stinky kid at the lunch table. And it's because like the team was such a feels bad team. Um, but when I play Geller Fox, it's never that way. Like everyone's happy to see me. Everyone's happy to play against Geller Fox, even though they know like it's a tough matchup. And I think innately it's because neither of us know what's going to happen with the funeral pains. Um, anything could happen. And I think that team in itself brings a lot less feels bad initially to the table where like frenzy was just like, hey, this is guaranteed to screw you over if you kill me. Um, so the team I found isn't as feels baddy as some other teams that people really dread to play against. Obviously, when you spike Fiona Pains, nobody's happy about that. But in an average game, it's like, well, yeah, you should have rolled about that. That's fine. I expected you to roll that or this. Um, unless you're a team that cannot beat Gellapox, which there are a few. Um, you want to call those out? Um, typically the salvagers have, there's not much they can do. Plasma knives are really good unless you only get one of them, uh, which the Galapox can limit you down to one. So you have like 12 equipment points that you have to spend on, you know, Bear overwatch, you know, uh, Harlequins don't really do so great into it because at worst, usually a Hulk can trade. Each Hulk will at least kill one Harlequin and yeah, now you're down to four Harlequins, typically. Like, good luck trying to kill them all. Uh, Felgors, a lot of people think that matchup is even. 
I don't think so. I, I think if you play it right and think about it, the Falcons have no hope. Um, which makes me real sad that they got nerfed again. Because <laughs> I won't see as many Felgors. Maybe they will. Maybe this will bring people out of the woodwork to play them now that they're more fair. Who knows? Uh, shout out to those guys who do that. Better for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Vekard now is probably not a too winnable matchup because the demo only goes once and now the spotter doesn't really stop me. Uh, the spotter used to. The spotter was a big problem. Because like turn one, you can just grenade launch into anyone you see because they're giant. Oh, you can't hide the hawks from visibility. Uh, but now the spotter only works in light cover. The hawks are always in heavy cover anyway, or they're in melee, which means the spotter never realistically gets a shot off on the hawks anymore, uh, which was critical for the matchup. It went from I have to play really careful to now it's just like I have to play normal. Um, so there, there's a few more teams out there, but. Those are pretty much, I think, the auto losses nowadays. Um, Do you feel like the elf teams are, in general, particularly well suited to playing against you, or is it like Void Dancers specifically are in a rough spot uh, any, just because they only have eight guys? Well, like Corsairs and Hand of the Archon are having a tough time in the meta in general. Like they can get some wins, but they can also take some losses. Um, so they were already like a coin flip into most matchups, and now it's like all of my guys are suited to dealing eight damage for sure. Like, every Hulk can kill you doing that. Uh, so it's just like, you can't really trade in melee. You can't afford to lose four operatives to four Hulks. Uh, the team doesn't, unless you get some crazy blasts off, they don't really have great options. Mm -hmm. Even if you do, like I played in Dallas, and you guys ever played where the boards are shifted one way, but the deployment is the other? Where, like, you have a, you're playing at a table mm -hmm. where the deployment it's like the is the terrain is, yeah, the terrain is like, clearly not set up for the the deployments that you're on well it's not that it's like um your deployment you're deploying on the side of the map rather than you are facing not your deployment zone basically oh sure 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 yeah yes. so i was playing on a map like that and i didn't quite realize that the abyssal could get a shot off into my back lines the way the maps were because it was sideways and i'm dumb so an abyssal got like a six hit shot off into my back lines at Dallas and he killed four guys. This is very tragic, very sad. And then that was all the Mandrick said for the rest of the game because it didn't matter. <laughs> um they, the elves really just can't deal with the Hawks when they get in there. Mm. And that's kind of the sad part. Um because I wish there was more play, but because they're so fragile, there's just not really a lot of options. You get the law of large numbers on dice that basically means that at some point a Hulk will get in and he'll probably do enough where the game becomes it flips the other way. Yeah, it's like, Lord help you if I get two of them in combat uh, because it's just a two for one trade. Now, most of those teams are down to like six, maybe seven operatives uh, facing like a 15 team, 15 man team. That's not great for them. Not good break points at all. No. Mm. When it comes to something like, you know, you know, obviously, we've talked a lot about Geller Pox here, but we've all been looking at Brood Brothers and Hernkin Jaegers a little bit. I think all three of us have played the teams a little bit. I've only played, I think I'm like six games deep on Brood Brothers. I've like noodled around with the Primus, played a bunch of the Patriarch because it's just kind of fun to have a wrecking ball. How have you been finding Kill Team Termination? Hmm. Um, so for me personally, I have played two matches in the Jaegers. I've played one match as Brood Brothers, but I've been doing a whole whole lot of reading. And um, I like the Jaegers a lot. I think they bring a cool puzzle to the game where like they can really push forward, but they can't like punish you for pushing forward. Uh, I like that a lot. They can get their points, but not make you not get your points, um, which I think was a big part missing from Salvagers, where they just couldn't get their points and they couldn't punish you. Um, I like what they can do. They have a lot of options. The Brood Brothers. Hmm. Are they're you of the cool. opinion that they're a little bit too good right now? I think they are too good in certain matchups. Hmm. Uh, I think there's some matchups where they just do better results than a lot of other teams that they've kind of stolen their the thunder um, rules, rules from. Like Vetguard. Um, I don't think Vetguard have a great time against Brood Brothers just because they're kind of upgraded. Now, that there are some faults to the Brew Brothers. I don't think they're as OP as a lot of people are talking about them being. 
and they do have some counterplay playing as them. When I played against Jaegers, I only won by one point. Um, granted, that was like my first game playing them, but it, they really do suffer in melee. And if you can get into their melee lines, like they don't have much to get out of it. Um, they really got to hope to get some cheeky shots off and stuff to keep up with the numbers. Um, I think they're a good team, though. And the Primus is just feels bad machine. Um, not a huge fan of just I had every initiative. I stole every single initiative with the Primus, which was I didn't like that. It's one of those of, things where it's like a it's like a thought process check, right? Like you now have to think about this step that you've taken for granted. So when you play against brood brothers and they take the Primus, now your the operative conditioning for your brain is I am not going to get first turn ever in the game. And you have to adjust all of your positioning around that that situation which sucks but it is something that you can actively think about and position around it's just not fun to play against sometimes sometimes you just need initiative though yeah. um, like you really need to swing things around and having a model that's just like hey you know that one thing that could go wrong in your game i do that all the time yep. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do think it, it, can, it can feel like a lot because you're now facing all this pressure. Well, the big thing for them is like most of their operatives are seven wound, seven wound guys. Like, you know, compared to something like Blooded where you can take a big guy and then two dorks, you're getting a nine wound operative, right? Nine wound operative with three APL, which is good, but you're still pretty fragile. So they end up playing in this different wound space for an over like an overpowered team compared to mass bodies with mass with like tons of wounds or just a huge stat block like geller pox or commandos are yeah what if what i've found with the team so far is the team has a lot of tricks and a lot of like hey you didn't pay attention to this so i'm gonna kill that operative that you didn't see that i could kill but from the results i was doing that i was doing a lot of those shots to keep up rather than actually like bully my opponent out of the game like, none of those shots, like, um, turn one, I killed a guy on guard with the obscured shot with the, what is it, the, the, um... Ruthless coordination, where you, yeah, ruthless send coordination. A, you send a familiar into the room to go spot your opponent, and then someone else just, like, blows him up. Yeah, I just took a guy off on guard with that ploy, turn one, just because I could do an obscured shot, and they were covering the whole room, but I wasn't in the room. Yeah. Um, but that just gave me an advantage in the game, but it didn't, like, get me... I didn't kick my opponent out of the game with that because, you know, the the trade off was now the like the plasma gunner was out for next turn, stuff like that. And they're weak. Everyone's really weak. And if you get flat back on certain things, you can't cover every angle with the team. I found like someone's going to fall short somewhere on a flank. And if your opponent has any capable in melee, they're going to get in there and just start wrecking because the team does not have capable melee besides like two guys. They have acceptable melee with not enough wounds to make it very threatening, is what I've right. seen. So like if you lose those frontline guys that are like, oh, I'm like four dice on fours, like the agitator, like if he dies, right. you're like, uh-oh. Now I don't have if anyone the defending this. dies, yeah. And, and the other thing is, the you hit on fours and you only get the reroll after the fact or you have to be within six inches of an agitator. So mm -hmm. it's not the easiest to make sure that you're doing better than four dice on fours. Like you can do it it's just either cost you a cp forces you into awkward positions so it does end up mattering a little bit more than something like team-wide ceaseless that beckard get yeah uh, i think the team will be more susceptible to dice than people realize especially facing melee hordes like scouts for example <laughs> um, i think that might be a new stat check on the brute brothers where everyone's just charging forward with these these hot ass marines uh and just I really can see that being a pretty bad matchup for the Brood Brothers right now, because I think Commandos are already one of those matchups that's kind of hard, and Scouts are basically Commandos with a different set of gun tools now. Yeah, I would agree. I think if you want to take on Brood Bros, I think they have some of the best shooting tactics in the game, and I think against shooting hordes, they're going to have the advantage quite a bit, no matter what operative they pick, if it's the Primus, if it's the Magus, or the Patriarch. Um, all of them are going to be great choices. Um, because no matter what, your action economy doesn't go down, and they're all a threat in their own unique way. I don't think there's any of them that are a wrong choice, and that's what's interesting. But when you get into melee teams, you're really going to have to be on your game with the Brute Brothers. I don't think they're infallible, like a lot of people are saying. Yep, that's kind of where I'm at, too.
I I have liked playing them. I've played the Patriarch a bunch. He's cool, but if he dies, you basically like lose instantaneously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he does need a babysitter at all times because he you need to keep him as healthy as possible. So making sure you've got the veteran nearby or just any random dork in range is super duper important for the Patriarch to see play at all. Yeah, the, the veteran is a big key to that match. Um, if yeah. you do, I found even with the Primus, like the veteran was saving my ass every fucking turn. I think the veteran is probably the most important random like specialist choice for the Brood Brothers because he does so much. He brings a pretty solid gun, you know, th- four dice on threes, four fours, a good profile. And importantly enough, he keeps your piece that is the entire reason why your team is good alive, which is super mm-hmm. duper important. And he could do it in melee, which is not a thing that we've generally had access to. The ability for you to unquestioning loyalty and jump in front of an attack can be done in melee, too, which is not a thing that dog teams, non-dog teams have had. Yeah, it is a great ability. And to do it for free with a team that's so CP reliant is is pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, I think Hernkin Jaegers are, you're right, they present a new play style to the team. Something that a lot of teams just don't have to think about is they get to get onto the mid board. They won't ever really get to your side of the board because they are still stuck at that four inches of movement. But on that first turn, you've got seven inches for anyone who needs to. And then after that, you've got all the counter punching tools in the world between the bombast getting a free shot on turn one or your ploy that lets you shoot people who charge your guys so you can chip wounds off and then they can just take out a power knife and stab someone. They've got a lot of toys to get get attacked, which is not a thing that most teams can do. Yeah, I like them quite a bit. I think they're designed well. Um, The mines, the mental game of the turn one mines. Your opponent has to think about that, but also think about what you're doing with your forward deploys. Um, I like the team because you can kind of you don't need the movement like a lot of people are saying, like, oh, they're only four inch move. That's that's terrible. If you get to your points, you just stay on your points. Take one of your opponent's points. and That's all you need to do. Don't get fancy. Don't try to take all the points. Just take one of them and just hold it to the best you can slow and steady like i feel like they between the two dwarf teams the hern can feel very much like the dwarfs i read about where they're stubborn and they move forward they get there and they're like we're good well you could do whatever you want we'll we'll be here tomorrow yeah that's a that's a uh, pretty good observation i think they're good i think they're gonna be a fun team i think a lot of people could find success with them uh, i don't think they're overtuned by any means necessary um I think we'll see some unique stuff coming out of them, which I'm excited for. That's the really Bird Brothers. They're a really good team as well, but I think a lot of their stuff is just going to be like, oh, well, I shoot from scared. I shoot from scared. You know, Patriarch got a cool play. Um, it's like, yeah, we, we, we see all that coming, though. Yeah. I think Brood Bros are kind of like a mishmash of veteran guard, blooded, and then they get like a weird shooting centric matchup where they get two silent weapons, which not a lot of teams get access to. So they play in three or four existing spaces, whereas Hernkin Jaeger have carved out this new niche where I think higher tech were sitting where they could sit on stuff and make you deal with them. But now that the Necrons res at three to five wounds compared to, you know, four or five to seven or five to eight, they don't mm-hmm. really get to play that style. Whereas Jaeger can play that style. They can threaten you with mines that force you to move around them. They get onto the midboard. If you charge them, they will take three attacks generally against most of the melee specialists because they mm-hmm. can cut one die in half. So they will take three attacks to kill, which means that they might not actually die when you charge them. They have four dice on fours with a reroll generally when you're on getting charged. So you will attack them. They'll parry you. You'll attack them. They'll parry you. And then suddenly they're not dead, which is, which is not enough. <laughs> and if they do survive, yep. you can heal them with resources um, there, I do want to call out a interesting interaction that I ran into in, in the, the game that I played a power sword. Like if you've got, um, if you've got a crit and I don't, for example, you can hit me with the normal, which will do two and then crit me for six and it'll kill me in two hits anyways. So, um, when you're playing against that, just remember the math is weird and you can just kill them in two hits, uh, and just, and, and slide right on past that. I will importantly call out that you cannot use resource points when you are in engagement range. So you 
you know, you can't go back up to not injured before you do the fight. But if you survive the fight, your opponent now has to commit a whole extra charge to go deal with this stupid dork hiding behind an objective. That's good enough, I think. Plus, like, another homie with a knife can run in and join you hitting on threes. And if you're using the masterful blade work, um, you're hitting on threes and you're balanced. And it's yep. lethal five. So, like, odds are pretty good that you're he's probably going to help another homie out. Then you can resource point him uh, once he's no longer in engagement. The other th- cool thing is if you can get people to overcommit onto objectives and they kill a Jaeger, suddenly that becomes a bubble of death. <laughs> because yeah, because the Jaeger have some of the cooler ploys, I think, across the board, like flavorful wise, you know, getting a reroll when you're in cover and shooting someone. Hilarious. Really fun piece of rules where you got to go do the visibility check on your opponent's side that people don't have to think about. And then if you kill a Jaeger, suddenly there's, a, a th- I think, a three inch bubble. Yeah. Yeah, the That's falling three inch, kin. Three inch, yeah. three inch radius. Yep, so three inch radius. Pretty big bubble. Yeah, so if you charge over to your friend's body, now suddenly you can take your normals to crits, which on plasma knives, that's big game. And you're failed to normals. But either way, there's there's so much flexibility that it really adds a lot more reliability. It's it is a pretty huge improvement. Yeah. And I think one of the other big, big changes or big things is that Hardy just knocks everything down to a normal normal hit which means that if your opponent goes in and is expecting a power sword to do anything suddenly they're in for a rough time oh, i didn't even yeah think you're gonna that. need a lot of melee? That. yeah it's any um oh no hardy is oh, only oh, defense only for shooting oh my bad my bad yeah oh, man because if it Whoop. was for melee oh man that would be spicy lot, you're right a lot easier of a time yeah. i mean yeah tough survivalist is already pretty good for melee you yeah. know um, yeah, as long as it's is pretty bro- broken in general, <laughs> like it's just well, you can kind of play around it because it's only the first time they take like the damage. Yeah. Um, so if you just do something first and then turn it off, you know they're kind of just sitting there. Yeah. You know, it's not if it was every time they took damage. Period. That'd be one thing, but you can turn it off with like a shooting attack first or a charge and then shoot stuff like that. It's a very cool pair of teams, I think, to add to the meta. I obviously people think that Brew Brothers are really overpowered. I still am of the opinion that they're probably as balanced as Vetguard were. Maybe they're better than Vetguard, but they're only better than Vetguard now, not Vetguard before the nerfs. Well, but that the matter of the fact is, you know, they are good now, and that's yeah. what counts, right? Yeah, because we have a new meta, and they are in the new meta. And a lot of people aren't going to be prepared for them. You need to know their tricks, I think. Like, you have to understand what they can do to you. Once you do, you can, you know, try to play around it the best you can. Uh, but I don't think their tricks are broken. Kind of like Colt just innately healing and then rushing in and killing everybody. Like, they don't bully you out of into the a, Into, a, like, a ball of... Uh, yeah, I yeah. think the big thing is they don't really bully you out of anything that you weren't already playing. Like, they shoot better, but they don't... And they shoot from, like, weird angles, but it's still just four dice on fours with one to two rerolls which is like fine it's not like you're free retaining two dice which would be way better yeah or like they don't have an insane like blasting gun where it's just like oh you didn't see this angle and now half your team gets shot for you know four four five ap2 some bullshit like that yeah um they do have some pretty nice tricks like that I always forget. So I've played, I think, five games with them and I've forgotten to use the end of activation dash every single game because I just like it's just not a part of my brain that I've had to think about. And I, you know, it's very powerful and it can let you set up some really gross stuff or just your opponent wants to try to do something. You're like, oh, well, I moved up and I shot on turn one. I'm going to move back down because it got pervasive and I just took a dash. I mean, yeah, it's also just in general, um, as long as you can meet the requirements you can do some pretty crazy stuff with it uh like it kind of gives an operative an extra apl in the in the same vein like yeah you're a free dash i did that in my one game where um somebody activated something he went off of an objective to go take another one and it's an objective i couldn't take it normally because uh my medic was only on one uh action point uh so i like he went to go move and I activated my medic for the dash. And he dashed onto a point behind a barricade. So he was in the line of sight. Like, mm-hmm. well, I'm only one APL, but I can take this back now. Because, you know. Need. Yeah. Back. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah you got to be careful in that play. I also hope people don't just straight up cheat with it. 
you know, accidentally, because it's, I think it's pretty easy to forget that you can't start or end in line of sight with it. Uh, I think a lot of people are just going to like, and a dash. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, you know, famously the worm blade full of, full of people who accidentally cheat, not on purpose. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe some people do it on purpose. Hopefully not. Maybe some people, but no. Usually it's but like generally just, in the kill team scene. It's an accident. The, the way the rules are written, it's like ah, I just forgot a condition. You're like, yeah, it's just so easy because there's just so many conditions. <laughs> so still pretty happy with where the meta is. You know, between the balanced data slate and the new releases. You know, obviously Geller Pox are still in a great spot, and Termination has not changed that. I assume. I assume Geller Pox. Are you scared of either of these teams? I'm not scared of Jaegers. I think Jaegers is going to be a good, fun fight. I don't like necessarily think I win um, or lose. I think it's going to be a good, solid battle. That's what I love to see. Um, I love it when I face up against a team and we both have things we're worried about rather than like, oh, I hope you live. I hope you roll some sixes or else this game's over. Um, I like them a lot. I think they're a good, solid team in a tough fight. The Brood Brothers, I don't know how that's going to go yet. If talking Geller Fox specifically, Specifically, they can take the Magus, they can take Lookout, where they're, you know, potentially minus APL all the time. Not my favorite thing in the world. But there's play around it to some capacity, and sure, you nerfed two Hulks, but there's four of them. Um, you know, if I start getting into those Gunners with the other two, you can minus APL, you know, Thrice Curse and another Hulk all day long. You still got to kill them. So I don't know how it's going to go yet. I have a suspicion that melee hordes are still going to be just fine into that team. And, you know, if you are taking those things, you are worsening your scoring ability by not taking the familiars. Um, so we'll see. I think it's going to take a lot of time for people to figure out this team and decide what actually is best. Because there's, there's a lot of options. And in a sense, that hurts a team because it's almost too many options and people will make the wrong choices. Or try to get fancy and do everything they can, but in turn, there was better plays of just like, oh, I set up this combo of one, two, three, four guys doing this. When really, if you just shot with the plasma gun, it was probably the better choice. Shooting <laughs> with plasma guns, famously very powerful. <laughs> yeah, the team might be too tricky for its own good, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's kind of what I was gonna say. They they seem like they they out KG other teams. So like if, if both players are being KG, they're going to be better at it. But if you just like bring a bunch of assault intercessors and just bully them and you just run up and then you're like, Oh, you're over there trying to do some cool tricky business. Let me cut this guy in half with a chain sword. Uh, like it's, it's kind of hard for them to solve. Yeah. I think brood brothers do have some pronounced weaknesses that people just assume that they can get around by four dice on fours plasma from weird angles or meltas, but you know, I've played enough four dice on fours on Pathfinders to know yeah, every once in a while you do one hit and you're like, all right, cool. I die now and they can save. They can always save out of the one die. Yeah, I mean, rerolling fours. I've played Zangors enough where Zangors have always had reroll and you always need three hits uh, for Zangors to do anything. And the amount of times I consistently got two hits on fours with Relentless was just criminal. Uh <laughs> So I, I take it with a grain of salt where it's just like, yeah, you might get some rerolls here and there, but just because you're rerolling doesn't mean it hits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like, and when it doesn't hit, it really, really sucks. Yeah, like f- yeah. F- for my for my intercessor run, if I was playing against like vet guard or anyone that had, you know, f- four dice on fours, you literally just run out on engage. They shoot their plasma, it whiffs, and then you eat their plasma alive. And it's just like it's a horrible time to be a guardsman. Yeah. All righty, all righty. I mean, you know, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about your local scene. You know, you want to talk up your area a little bit because we always like to hit up players' local player bases, scenes, tournaments that are coming up. Obviously, we've got the Goonhammer Open coming up. You just talked about Geller Pox on last week's Balanced Data Slate podcast, and I am excited to see what you've brought on the the deep the deep sea geller pox but oh. what about the rest of the local scene any people you want to call out you know adrian m's local monthly you know so Absolutely. yeah adrian adrian was doing the lord's work in terms of our local scene uh he's been running one pretty much every month um which has been good because uh plaza spam in baltimore haven't really had the time to run some unfortunately mm-hmm. um so we've been having a monthly things down in dc at your hobby place 
you know, if you're in the area, always try to check it out. It's a good time. It's a very competitive scene. If you're looking for practice for tournaments, it's one of the best to be a part of. You know, at any given time, we usually have like three to four golden ticket winners in the building, um, which is pretty good. Um, and for some folks, it's a tough time and they know that and they're, they still show up. So we got a good hearty group with us. Um, the uh, Baltimore scene, we've been growing at Titan Games every Tuesday night. If you're in the Maryland area, um, you know, Titan Games every Tuesday, we have about 10 to 11 players playing every day. Nice. Um, we've got quite a good scene and I bring food. I bring a lot of food for people to take home because I work at a catering company. So if nothing else, you can come down and get some kill team and food. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all we've had going on in our scene. My the goon hammer. Oh man. I'm really excited about that next week. It's yep, like yep. five minutes from my work so I can go do it and work. <laughs> I did hear about this from the grapevine. You're an absolute <laughs> madman. You know, outside of that, you know, we've got the New York Open end of October. So hopefully anyone who's listening and is looking for an East Coast tournament, we've got that. Tacoma is coming up for Games Workshop. And we've got Tampa, I think, later in the year on the East Coast. So still a fair number of golden tickets floating around. But yeah, yeah Tuesdays, Tuesdays in Baltimore. That's the day, huh? Hell yeah. Why don't you come down, Travis? Well, I'll host you over for the night if you want to stop by. <laughs> I work I work Tuesday through Saturdays right now, so I'll I'll see if I can get a day off, if I can carve a day out someday. That'd be fun. Like, that'd be great. That'd be cool. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> all righty, all righty. Anything else you want to call out before we head out? I feel like today's podcast was pretty in-depth on a lot of topics, so I'm pretty happy with it so far. I've started a tradition on the Squad Games podcast, and I'm going to throw it over to here because you can't stop me. I'm going to shout out Alexander Popov. That guy is great. We love Alexander Popov. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, Alexander Popov. We're, we're here shouting you out. Hell yeah. Well, thank you listeners for listening until the end. As always, if you haven't already uh, left us a review, do that. We love you. See you next week.